So this morning's scripture, um, we're going to continue in Corinthians. Uh, not, I did that at the earlier service. It's not Corinthians, it's Colossians. Colossians is, a, is one of Paul's epistles. An epistle is a letter that he wrote. He wrote it to the church in, uh, Col- I never say it right, so I'm going to spell it for you. C-O-L-L-A-S-E. Um, it was it was like a tri-city area. If you can think of New York City, right? New York City has five boroughs. This was like a city with three boroughs. And it was a huge center of commerce like New York City. There's all kinds of philosophies and different religions and different ideas running around. And Paul is trying to start this church And it's still that first generation after Jesus was on the scene and he died and was resurrected. There were still eyewitnesses around that people could fact check and and know that people saw like Jesus Christ risen. And, um, And he's writing this church and he's trying to keep them on track from all of these philosophies that are pushing in on them. There's philosophies of works righteousness. So... If you, uh, if you want to get into heaven or if you want to be saved, you got to do X, Y, and Z, right? You got to do the Ten Commandments. You got to do this or that. You got to help 10 people a day. There were also these people that were talking about uh, circumcision. So if you're a young person, it's just not something fun. But the Jewish people as part of their covenant with God, were circumcised. So they felt that in order for a person to become a true Christian, they had to go through a circumcision ritual. Men, women don't get circumcised, but men would have to do that. And that wasn't true. There were all of these kosher laws and laws about food food sacrifice to idols, food sacrifice to Roman gods, food that uh, just wasn't what God had told the Jewish people to eat. And, and, um, and there were people running around telling uh, the new church that they had to do all of these things and keep kosher law and to be true Christians. On the Roman side, the Romans had tons of gods. They had gods all over the place, gods for everything, the god of the sun, the god of the field, the god of the wine, the god of, you know, you name it. So you were supposed to be worshiping the Roman gods because you were in Rome. And all of those influences were pushing in on this little church. So Paul was trying to help them and encourage them in what true Christianity was. So the last week we talked, three weeks ago, we talked about how um, Paul calls his churches, the churches that are starting, really to think through their theology, to think through how they understand God and what they know of Jesus and to stand firm in that because there's all kinds of influences. If you think about the influences today versus the experience you might have had with God that changed your life, I can tell you from my vantage point that I had, I had many experiences over the course of my life, some huge and some m- minor, but each one of those experiences with God has shifted me in, in a good direction. And as soon as it shifts me in a good direction, almost inevitably someone or something comes along and tries to shift me back. Just as much Paul talks about the powers and principalities of this world that we can't see that that have an impact on us and, and are trying to draw us away. It's just part of what happens as a human. So Paul's addressing all of that in these letters, and he's telling us that we really need to think about what we know and stand firm in it. And he says in this section, be rooted in Jesus. Last week we talked about what he, was, what he was trying to do is he was trying to explain Jesus to the church in a way that really solidified it. And if you try and explain the incomprehensible God who came in the flesh in Jesus Christ and died for our sins on the cross and then was risen again for us 
to, as a sign and a seal that, we're, that we are gods forever as Christians. If you try and define God, it's, it's, how would you define your experience with God in a way that would have a lasting impact on the people around you? Sometimes words are inexplicable when it comes to God. We, we might be able to explain some of the characteristics or some of our relationship with God or some of the things we do because we love God and want to do them. But to, to actually incorporate this entity that's bigger than the whole universe that we can't even comprehend, not only is bigger, but is part of it and created it. And all, Paul goes on and on for several verses about who Jesus is and and and. and and tries to explain that he was the firstborn of the dead, first one raised from the dead. And he was here before all creation was here with God the Father. And, and he goes on, and what he's doing is he's building an argument to say, look, all this stuff, this God that's incomprehensible but intimately personal with you, he just wants a relationship. There's no strings attached. It's a love relationship. You've heard me say, if you've been here, you've heard me say, talk about marriages that way, right? You don't, you don't want your spouse to have to love you or need you. You don't want them to be in the marriage because they're, because they're locked in, they can't escape. You want them to be in a marriage where they want you, where they want to talk to you. They want to love you. They want to sacrifice for you and be part of your life every step of the way. Is my marriage that way? I'm working on it. But that's the concept, right? So God doesn't say... Jesus came on the scene and he said to everybody, all the people, all his followers, he said, there's one rule left. You don't have to worry about anything else. One rule, love as you've been loved. And what he's saying is he wanted to be with his disciples. And he wanted them to be, he wanted them to want to be with him. He wanted them to want to be in a relationship with God, want to be praying, want to be living to the Ten Commandments, want to be, uh, back then they didn't have the Bible, well, they had the Torah, but they didn't have the Bible as we have it today. But w wanting to be in the Word of God and understand God, wanting to love people around them, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. And because, and because the more we do that stuff, the more blessed we find ourselves. And something that depends on how mature you are in your faith, but the, the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus paid was ultimate, but the blessing was ultimate. And sometimes... As Christians, God calls us to huge sacrifice for people. Now, come on, stay with me. For people that might not want it or appreciate it. Jesus died for the world. There's 50,000 people in Jackson. How many of those people want that relationship? but he still died for them. And when we interact with them, we can be the face of Christ to them. And hopefully they see Jesus in a way. Hopefully we can describe Jesus in a way that helps them take a step closer to God. <clears throat> Paul, this morning in, in the text I'm about to read you, that was all preface. So we got a long way to go. Um, <clears throat> the text I want to invite you to stand to read as I read um, is from uh, Colossians 2, 6 through 19. So um, out of honor and respect for the word, would you please stand if you're able? 
So now he, he, he's gotten through all of that, and now he says this. He says, so then, just as you've received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That's a list right there. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you've been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So you see, he says, the new circumcision is baptism. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which, st which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailed it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in the false hum humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen, they are puffed up with the idle notion by their unspiritual minds. They have lost connection with the head from the body, uh, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God calls it, causes it to grow. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This, like last week, is so rich and powerful, and there's so many different avenues to head down. This morning, I just want to give you one simple thing that I want to encourage you to do as we, as we come to communion. Paul's whole push in this letter is twofold. One is don't be deceived by the philosophies of the world around us. Don't give in to more is better. Don't give in to works righteousness. You know, the more you work, the, the better you are. Don't give in to the idea that if you're going through suffering right now or at any point in your life, that God is not part of your life and working with you through it and loving you and nurturing you. Don't give in to the philosophies of the people around that just push in on us about, you know, uh, I don't even want to get into it. I can go on a tangent. So he said, don't give in to that stuff. It was, it, he wrote 2,000 years ago. It was there then. 2,000 years before him, it was there then. It's here today. It will be here in 2,000 years as long as our planet survives so we can survive on it, which is a whole nother sermon. 
His other point is that he really, really wants us as Christians to engage in a relationship with God because we want to. He really is, is pushing hard on the idea that the deeper our relationship with God is, you know, if we're rooted in Christ, I have a, I have a basil plant at home. I like, to, I like to grow things in the summer. And this year, I kind of gave up on a couple plants. I don't know why, but I just stopped watering a couple plants. So my poor basil plant didn't get any water. I stopped nurturing it. And it withered and died. It had a great root system. It was growing like crazy. And I just gave up. Paul is saying, if you nurture, in, in, in your baptism, you're rooted in Christ. Don't get withered. Feed your soul and you'll see incredible blessing. You'll, how, how many people in here don't have a smartphone? I'm not going to judge you. I just want to say, okay. Even on not smartphones, I think they call, I called them dumb phones. That's really not fair. I think they call them feature phones now. Even on feature phones, most feature phones, in your smartphones, you have alarm settings. I want to challenge all of you this week to do something so basic, there's no reason for you not to do it. Other, unless you're oppositional defiant like I am, then. <laughs> that's, that, that's a whole nother thing. <clears throat> Set your phone for a daily time that you typically have a little bit of free time. Maybe it's lunch. Set the alarm and name the alarm prayer or Bible reading or whatever it is that you think is easy for you. And when that alarm goes off, just do the spiritual discipline. You don't need to pray for an hour to develop your relationship. If you're married or been married, you know that sometimes you can walk in, give your spouse a hug, tell them you love them, and it makes a world of difference in the relationship, and it took less than 30 seconds. Prayer is that way. Set your alarms and, and take a daily journey in your relationship with God. That's my challenge to you. But what Paul's saying is just develop. Nurture the relationship. You won't wither, but you'll grow. Communion, now, now here's my pitch for worship. You ready? You're all here, so this is good. You've got to tell all the people who aren't here. Worship is a huge spiritual discipline. I don't know if you know that. And part of worship that is, is acknowledging the fact that God is God. We're here singing songs, listening to scriptures, listening to me, acknowledging that God is God and we are not. Acknowledging that God is the sustainer of life and that there are times in our lives where we are not in control of that and we have to rely on God. Acknowledging that, that humbly before God that we're here developing our relationship with him.